You have no idea the stress I've had trying to prepare this, you know. One obstacle after another. However, I'm here now, and hopefully Cameron will get the word of God up, which is essential. I'll read it out anyway. Today's talk is called The Natural Man. Well, we're all natural people, aren't we? But God has something to say about the natural man. And I'll read it out. First Corinthians chapter 2. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them or understand them. Because they are spiritually discerned. Now this phrase, natural man, in the original language, which is important, suchikos, soulish. It's in contrast to spiritually, pneumatikos. I'm not trying to be fancy here. Yeah! Amazing. I don't know about click to add subtitle, but that's not part of the Word of God, by the way. <clears throat> so, literally, translated to English, psychikos means soulish, pertains to the soul, and pneumatikos means spiritual, pertaining to the spirit, right? So what does this verse tell us? The Holy Spirit has things he wants to tell us, right? The things of the Spirit. And it says that the soulish man, or the soul, does not receive, or discern, or understand the things of the Spirit. Yeah? Does this actually work? I don't think so, does it? It does work. No, it doesn't work. This one works. No, because it's going into the same thing. I need to get the next one up. What is the soul? That's it. What is the soul? We need to know that. It's very important that we understand what the soul is. It is very frustrating that every English translation of the Bible virtually does not translate the soul until it's forced to do it. And therefore, there's an awful lot of misunderstanding and ignorance about an essential part of the Christian life. And the soul is an important part, an essential part of the Christian life, and how it behaves and how we control it. Now, we have souls, and we need a soul. The soul is what interprets the information coming from the world. It's linked to our five senses. Think of it as the body being a computer. That's the hardware, right? But the body doesn't work very well without software. And the software is the soul for the body. Yeah? Now, the soul does not have any life of its own. What? I've never heard that before. The soul does not have any life of its own. Well, so the soul does not have any life of its own. <coughs> The soul receives its power, think of it as the electricity, from the spirit. Okay? So before we're born again, we still have a spirit that gives life to the soul and body, but it's dead. A wee bit like how demons are not alive to God. So before we're born again, we are not alive to God, and we live in the soul rather than the spirit. So the soul allows us to enjoy this life all the things that God gives us, right? It allows us to interact and react with the environment, the world. The soul is the seat of our emotions. I know that today because I was furious about a hundred things. Now these are all proper functions of the soul, right? Next, next... Uh, 
Yeah. That's it. I bet it never. Whatever. Right. Unfortunately, these bullet points should come up one by one, so that you're getting to know what's happening before I tell you. Which is unfortunate. <laughs> the soul is corrupted. We're fallen. We're in Adam. The soul is of Adam. The spirit is of Christ. The soul is of Adam. That's very important. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, Shh, I'm worth it. Ever seen them gloating over a chocolate biscuit on the, the telly? It's not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, so, the soul res responds to these inputs from the world, both good and bad. I mean, we are in the image of God after all. And we can do good things. Even worldly people love their own type of people, you know? But it's attracted to a lot of bad things, ungodly things, devilish things. So the soul is the base of the self-life, the feelings, our preferences, our excesses, obsessions, it gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Addictions, idolatries. These are all things, according to the type of person you are, which your soul does. And of course, this kind of depravity varies from person to person. Some low-life people. Have you ever noticed how they get euphoric when they get their own way? And then when they don't get their own way, they go into some fierce display of displeasure. And that verse on the bottom train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it. So if children are taught not to have ex excessive um, self-life well you know what I mean self-control, especially biblical instruction these, these, when they grow up they will not be so, so susceptible to the things of the world and the depravities of the flesh. Okay. Next slide, thanks, please. The Bible has a term called the flesh. It's not very fashionable in new translations. And there's not very much biblical or godly in most new stuff. Uh, new translations of the Bible are no different. But the, the Bible says that the body and the flesh, uh, the body and the soul together are called the flesh. And the Bible does not have anything complimentary to say about the flesh. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8.8. 8. So the natural man the man of the world who's not born again cannot please God. Jesus said, it's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nada. So here's what Paul says about that. <clears throat> For I know that in me, that is my flesh, dwells no good thing. He says, I like to do it, but I, don't, I can't perform it because of the body of this death. That's what he says, the body of this death. That's in Romans. So don't think that it's just the world. 
whose flesh can't please God. For the whole book of Galatians is about our church, which lives in the flesh. You're like ordinary men, said Paul. Now here's an interesting verse. Why have I put that up there? What's the relevance of that in Galatians? In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation, a new spirit from God. What does this mean? It means that no religious observance or rituals or anything can improve the flesh. That's what it says. Is there any doubt? Are we convinced that there's nothing good in us apart from what God gives us? Now, next one, please. The mind of the flesh is enmity towards God. That's in Romans again. And in Ephesians, I'll read that. Put off concerning your former conduct, the old man. That's another synonym for the flesh. Which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which is Christ. Which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So again, we have this contrast, okay? But what I want to point out from these two verses is the word mind. Our consciousness. What controls our consciousness? Is it the old man? Or is it the new man? Is it the soul or the spirit? So when we're born again, we have two inputs. We have one from God, and we had one from the world. And our mind decides consciously what we're going to do what we're going to follow, who we're going to be loyal to. Yeah? Next one, please. So how do we discern what's coming from God and what's coming from our feelings? Now, before we are born again, all we have are these natural feelings and reasonings and speculations and what we're going to do with our life and how kind or bad life is to us, right? But when we are born again, something happens to us. We get sensations that we didn't have before. <clears throat> we didn't have sensations we didn't have before, right? Suddenly we've got peace. Suddenly we've got a new confidence. Suddenly we love God. And at first we think these are for us. I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I went to that gospel. I feel so much better. Well, so you should. But these feelings are from God. And it takes a while for us to understand what is of God and what is of us, right? Here's an idea. The soulish person. That music is so spiritual, so uplifting. That sunset how marvellous it makes me feel. Life's worth living. That's a soulish person. But a person who is God-conscious, 
careful, that's our Eastern mystics use that word. But anyway, those who are sensitive to God, they'll say, you know that sunset? Who can fathom the works of God? Look what he does for us. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people. And when you look at the sunset, not like the soulish person, but giving thanks to God, you'll find that there's a different sensation from the person who's uplifted. That's the spirit. That's God responding to us. Okay? And you still feel uplifted, but there'll be a different quality to it. So the next verse tells us something more about that. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Sanctify you completely. No, that's the wrong one. For the word of God is living and powerful. The Bible. Scripture. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. That's one of these verses where the translators have had have been forced to use the word soul because if they use any of the other words they prefer to use, it wouldn't make sense. But here we have it, in black and white, from the apostle himself, from God himself, the division of soul and spirit. It takes time. So what happens? It says that the word of God produces this. We read the Bible. The Bible was food for our spirit. Right? It does. When you read a passage from the Bible, it speaks to you. And you feel different. It reminds you of being born again. At the same time, it convicts against the excesses of the soul. It makes you embarrassed about the soul life. So what happens is that the soul life shrinks and the spirit grows. Grows in God. So whereas when you're first born again you don't know the difference between soul and spirit, after a while, and along with your experience of God too, not just reading the Bible, the two start to separate. So the next verse, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless. So this shift from soul to spirit is what God wants for sanctification. Because as we said, the excesses of the soul are controlled, the soul no longer is the boss. Our feelings no longer dominate our lives. We look to God. We walk by faith. Next one, please. That might be the last one. No. I had me have to speak about that last one. Can you move back one before we come to that one? Yeah. So we still have the soul for the proper functioning of our lives, but our lives are obedient to God because we're aware of what God is saying to us. Here's an idea. So your mind is either in the spirit or the soul, right? Now we, we are complete people. We don't go about thinking, am I in the soul or the spirit today? It's not like that. It's what, it's what your mind is and how more control the spirit has over your thinking. And what happens is, when you start, after a while, and your soul life shrinks and the spirit gets stronger, 
You get checks all the time about what you're thinking. So if you're watching the TV and you see on the schedule something not very nice, you think, oh, that's interesting. Immediately God will say, ah, oh, keep clear of that. That kind of thing. So it's not necessarily constantly God telling you, do this and do that. I mean, I, I, know, I know someone, the more than one, they're so caught up in knowing what God wants them to do, they don't they have to pray about what they're having for their breakfast. Honestly, it's not like that. So this, the Spirit wants to oversee our thoughts and correct us when we go, when, when we go off track. Yeah? So, okay, we can move to the last, the last one. Let's go back to our first verse. The natural man. The soulish man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. We know the contempt that the world has for the Word of God, and for God himself. It's foolishness to them. Contemptible. They're totally ignorant of what awaits them or the world as it really is. Now, the spiritual man, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what we've been saying. We want the mind to be spirit conscious and not soul and world and body conscious. We don't walk in our feelings. We walk by faith. That you may prove, as distinct from not being able to know, we can now prove, discern, what is a good, acceptable, perfect will of God. That's all I want to say. I said it shorter than I thought I would. And I can now hand back to Ian, who will, I better pray first. Otherwise, I think Ian is going to lead the...